Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Cornwell, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development here at Plunkett Cooney. It's my pleasure to serve as coordinator once again for today's program, which is part of our Sophisticated Employer Webinar Series sponsored by the Labor and Employment Law Practice Group. Employee leave requests continue to bubble to the top of the list of suge suggested topics we get uh, for our Sophisticated Employer Webinar Series. So we're tackling it once again, but this time we're focusing on leave requests under state and federal law, specifically the Michigan Paid Medical Leave Act and the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. We've also mixed in some common workplace scenarios as part of today's presentation. Fortunately, once again, we have two experts with us. They're both uh, members of Plunkett Cooney's Labor and Employment Law Practice Group, Laura Dynan from our Petoskey, Michigan office, and Claudia Orr from our Detroit office. As always, uh, before we get started, I'd like to take just a few minutes to provide you with some background about today's speakers in our law firm. For those of you who don't know, Plunkett Cooney is based in Southeast Michigan and is one of the Midwest's oldest and largest law firms with approximately 150 attorneys. We have offices in eight Michigan cities, as well as in Chicago, Illinois, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Columbus, Ohio. Plunkett Cooney's employment law practice group includes more than 20 attorneys who work in the areas of traditional labor law, human resources consulting, employment litigation, and workers' compensation claims. Our sophisticated employer webinar series is, is designed to help human resource professionals, risk managers, and business executives stay up to date on important legal issues and to provide HR best practices as well as to discuss trends in workforce management. Our webinar is approved for 1.25 general recertification credit hours through HR, the HR Certi Certification Institute and 1.25 professional development credits through SHRM. Following today's program, a certificate of, of completion will be emailed to each of you reflecting this credit. If you don't need the uh, CE credit, simply disregard the certificate. And now a little bit of background about our speakers today. Uh, first up, we'll uh, mention Laura Dynan, who has over 30 years of experience advising employers. She's built a successful practice representing public and private sector employers of all sizes throughout Northern Michigan. Laura's expertise includes traditional labor law and all types of employment law matters. She's a past president and currently the secretary of the board of directors of Northern Michigan Society of HR Directors. Also with us is Claudia Orr, who has nearly 30 years of experience representing employers ranging from, from Fortune 500 companies to small businesses and nonprofits. Claudia provides advice on all aspects of employment law and defends her clients when litigation and administrative issues arise. She's also regularly, uh, regularly serves as an arbitrator and as a mediator in employment law cases. She uh, is serving as a member of the Board of Directors of Detroit Sherm for the second time, uh, this time as secretary. She's also, she also remains a member of the organization's Legal Affairs Committee. Now for our, just a couple housekeeping notes about today's program. For the Q&A portion of our webinar, we'll use our questions widget on our GoToWebinar navigation display. If you can, please take a moment now to locate the widget and feel free to enter questions as they occur to you during the program. At the end, we'll uh, try to answer as many questions as time permits. I always add this caveat though, um, it, when asking a question, please make it somewhat generic. We don't want to get into specific workplace issues uh, to protect privacy. So I hope you agree with that and keep them general in nature and we'll answer them to the best of our ability. Finally, I want to mention that today's session is being recorded and, uh, re and that recording will be available uh, hopefully later today on our website, which is located at plunkacuni.com. So thanks for uh, attending today's program. Now let's get started and see what's new in employment law. Laura, I believe you are up first, so take it away. Thanks, John. Um, we have a lot of information today, so hopefully um, we won't go too fast for you. I'm going to start with an overview of FMLA and the Paid Medical Leave Act as a refresher or an introduction if they're new to you. Um, first, uh, you have to consider what issues should be considered. You look at coverage. Does the law apply to you as an employer? Then eligibility. If you're a covered employer, is the employee eligible for time off under the law? Then you look at the reason they want time off. Does the law permit time off for the reason given by the employee? And finally, what does the employer's policy provide? And these are some of the issues we're going to consider today. Um, 
a covered employer under the Family and Medical Leave Act is a private employer of 50 or more employees for 20 or more work weeks in the current or preceding calendar year. It also covers public agencies and schools regardless of size. Under FMLA, an eligible employee works for a covered employer, has worked for them for at least 12 months, but they don't have to be consecutive months, they just have to have occurred in the last seven years. They have to have worked at least 1,250 hours for that employer during, during the 12 months immediately preceding the leave. And they have to work in a location with 50 employees within 75 miles of their work location. If they're an eligible employee for a covered employer, they can take up to 12 weeks of leave in a 12 month period for birth of or placement of an adopted child or foster child to care for their spouse, son, daughter, or parent with a serious health condition for the employee's own serious health condition if it makes the employee unable to perform the essential functions of his or her job, and then for any qualifying exigency due to call to active duty, and they can take up to 26 weeks in one 12-month period to care for an injured service member. They can use FMLA leave in blocks of time, intermittently, or on a reduced schedule. Uh, FMLA requires them to follow the employer's policy and procedures. They have to provide medical or military certification. You can use the Department of Labor forms for that. And they have to make the request 30 days in advance when the need is foreseeable. Michigan's Paid Medical Leave Act um, is somewhat similar to FMLA in a few aspects. Primarily, um, it covers persons, firms, businesses, nonprofits, governmental entities that employ 50 or more employees. Under the Paid Medical Leave Act, an eligible employee is an individual engaged in service to an employer in the business of the employer and from whom the employer is required to withhold for income tax purposes. Not eligible for paid medical leave are individuals who are exempt under the Fair Labor Standard Act white collar exemptions, employees of private employers that are subject to a collective bargaining agreement that is actually in effect, employees of the federal government or a state other than Michigan, employees whose primary work location is not in Michigan, employees age 20 or younger that are paid a training wage, under Michigan law, employees employed by a temp agency, and then in individuals employed by the employer for 25 weeks or fewer in a calendar year if the job they hold is scheduled to only last 25 weeks or fewer. And finally, individuals who worked on average fewer than 25 hours per week during the immediately preceding calendar year. P uh, paid medical leave is earned under this new act. The employer can provide 40 hours of paid medical leave to eligible employees at the beginning of their benefit year. The benefit year is defined as any consecutive 12 month period used by the employer to calculate eligible employees benefits. So, you could use calendar year if that's how you do it. You can use anniversary date if that's how you do it. It's um, specific to each employer. You can prorate the um, paid medical leave that they earn if you hire new employees during the benefit year, although there's some question as to whether that's applicable um, this year because of the first year and the way the act went into effect. If an employer front loads the 40 hours of paid medical leave, they do not have to allow employees to carry over any time left over into their next benefit year. If an employer uses the accrual method, eligible employees have to accrue paid medical leave 
one hour for every 35 hours they work beginning their first day of work. They don't have to be allowed to use any time, however, until they've reached the 90th day of employment. They, you do not have to allow them to earn more than one hour per calendar week. You can limit the accrual to 40 hours per benefit year. If you use this method, however, you have to allow employees to carry over unused sick leave up to 40 hours into the next year. But you also can limit their use to 40 hours in a benefit year, so they could carry it over and have an excess of 40 hours in the following calendar or benefit year, but you would only have to let them use 40 of those hours. Uh, paid medical leave has a little broader definition of um, allowable uses. The time can be used for an employee's mental or physical illness, injury, or health condition, and it includes preventative care. It can be used for an employee's family member's mental or physical illness, injury, or health condition, including preventative care. It can be used for the employee or a family member if they are a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, and it can be used for such things as taking, uh, relocating, going to counseling, um, court dates, things like that. And it can also be used if the workplace or a child's school is closed due to a public health emergency or a communicable disease. Under paid medical leave, there's a broad definition of family. Family member includes biological, adopted, or foster child, stepchild or legal ward, or a child to whom the employee stands in loco parentis. It also includes the biological parent, foster parent, step parent, adoptive parent, or legal guardian of the employee, or the employee's spouse, or a person who stood in loco parentis to the employee when they were a minor. It includes legal spouse, grandparent or grandchild, and biological foster or adopted sibling. Finally, um, paid medical leave can be used in one hour increments unless as an employer you have a different written policy restricting the use of paid medical leave. Excuse me. For example, you require them to use it in half day increments. If it's in writing in your handbook, you're allowed to do that. Um, the employees must follow the employer's customary notice, procedures, and documentation requirements, and provide documentation within three days if the employer requests it to verify the need for the leave. And there are posting requirements that employers must follow or there are penalties outlined in the act for not doing that. Claudia, I think you were going to pick up here? Yes. Um, so t t today we're going to present the laws by comparing and contrasting how issues would be resolved under FEMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, and, and under PMLA. And we're going to use a hypothetical to go through it. So let me tell you briefly a little bit about one of my new clients. Just got her today. The Urban Revitalization Bank Organization, otherwise known as Turbo. It was started in 2010. It hired 20 employees to start, and it's been growing ever since. It currently has 58 employees, but some are part-time and some live in another state. Over half of its employees are classified as exempt, and about a dozen are under contract. Also last year, whatever under contract means, also last year during the warmer months, there was a layoff, and about 15 employees were let go for a period of time. Fortunately, they've all been rehired, but some still aren't working full time. Turbo treats its employees well and grants PTO time, pay time off to them. An employee who works at least 20 hours a week will receive 40 hours of PTO each January 1st. And employees who work 40 hours a week receive 80 hours of PTO each January 1st. It's a use it or lose it system. Turbo has a phenomenon H HR director. Um, her name is Ms. Ima Wright, 
who tries to stay current with all the changes in the law, and she strives to apply the law correctly. Lately, however, Ms. Wright feels a little overwhelmed with the new Paid Medical Leave Act and is not quite sure how to interpret it when other laws such as FEMLA or Americans with Disabilities Act may also be implicated. <clears throat> Ms. Wright cares about the employees and gets to know a lot about their lives, actually sometimes a little too much. This is what she knows about an employee named Mr. Malinger. Mr. Malinger has worked for Turbo since February 2019. His hours have varied somewhat over time since he was hired, but he always works three to four days a week. Mr. Malinger provided work, previously worked for Turbo for about eight months, sometime back around 2012 or 2013. Mr. Malinger has two children, one who is 32 years old and one who is seven. One of his children we know was in a car accident that left the child with some sort of permanent injury. Mr. Malinger lives with a woman who is in her 40s who is also pregnant and may be ready to give birth. But we don't really understand the relationship. We don't know what it is between Mr. Malinger and the woman. The rumor is that her pregnancy may have been the result of rape. Ms. Wright is seeking advice because Mr. Malinger just told a supervisor that he needs some time off for a medical reason. He didn't say how much time, but he did indicate that it's possible he may need even more time off and possibly as much as four months. Ms. Wright calls another friend who works in HR seeking guidance, but realizes along the way that she may not have all the facts she needs to in order to know what to do. So. The question becomes, what facts or what, if any, rights does Mr. Malinger have under FEMLA and PMLA? We'll consider the ADA necessary if, if, if necessary. So let's drill down a little bit deeper. Okay. Let's look at the issue of whether Turbo is an employer under either FMLA or PMLA. Does Turbo have to provide an eligible employee with leave under FMLA if 10 of its current 58 employees are part-time and work less than 20 hours a week? Actually, Laura, yes. Uh, FEMLA coverage depends only on whether, whether the employer has had 50 or more employees each working day during each of the 20 or more calendar work weeks in the current or preceding calendar year. So 20 or more, 50 or more employees each working day for at least 20 of the weeks, calendar weeks in the current year or last year. And it doesn't matter whether they are full-time or part-time or how many hours they work a week. Okay, thanks, Claudia. Does Turbo have to provide eligible employees with paid time off under the Paid Medical Leave Act if half the 58 employees are exempt and some live in another state? Yes, actually, PMLA only depends on whether it has 50 or more employees currently, as, which is different than FEMLA, and it does not matter if they are exempt or non-exempt, full-time or part-time, how many hours they work, or where they live for determining whether Turbo is an employer subject to the PMLA. Well, what if the uh, about a dozen, say 12 of the employees, um, the 58 employees that they employ are under contracts? Does that matter for <clears throat> FMLA or PMLA? Well, if they are truly independent contractors, then yeah, it would matter for both laws. Only employees actually count. But if they are simply employees who have employment contracts, then that fact doesn't matter. If by under contract it means with a staffing company, for FEMLA, that may mean that they are actually joint employers. And there's a relationship that's been created between Turbo and the staffing company. If that happens, the staffing company is the primary employer but generally, Turbo would need to count the temporary employees towards the requisite 50 or more employees for coverage under FEMLA, and would also generally be required to accept the employee back at the end of the leave of absence. 
since the specifics matter, it would be important to seek legal advice when this issue comes up. Okay, so I think that covers uh, the issue of whether Turbo is an employer. Let's now look at the issue of whether Mr. Malingerer is an eligible employee. So Mr. Malingerer was hired in February of this year. Can he have a right to take a leave of absence under FMLA? Well, Laura, that depends. Only if the time he previously worked for the company was within seven years. And if so, then you add that time together with the time he worked mm -hmm. for Turbo this year to see if seven years um, have been satisfied. Remember, all we know is that he used to work for Turbo for about eight months, sometime back around 2012 or 2013. So if it's within the seven years, you'll count those months, you'll add it to the months this year and see if he qualifies. Okay, given that he was hired in February of this year, does he have a right to time off under the Paid Medical Leave Act? Well, maybe. Uh, length of employment is not a factor for eligibility under PMLA. The first year, however, an employee has to wait until his 90th day to use his, his PTO under the Paid Medical Leave Act. And he only gets a pro rata share of the hours based on his date of hire. His date of hire. However, because he was hired before the law was enacted, he's actually not treated as a newly hired employee this year. But an employee hired after the PMLA was enacted will be considered a new employee for this year. I'll only get a pro rata share of the 40 hours based on the remainder of the 12 month period the employer's using. Okay, but so what effect, if any, does the fact that he works three to four days a week have? Does he have any right to take a leave under FMLA based on his hours of work? Well, whether he is eligible would depend on whether he worked 1,250 hours during the, the 12 month period preceding the day the leave will begin. Normally the number of days the employee works is not relevant, but the total number of hours they actually worked. However, because we know Mr. Malinger didn't work any time last year, since he was just hired in February of 2019, he won't qualify because he will not have worked 1,250 hours during the prior 12 month period. Okay, so let's change it up just a little bit. Mr. Malinger works three to four days a week. Would he have an, any right to take paid time off under the Paid Medical Leave Act based on his hours of work? Well, normally the employee is qualified if he worked on average 25 hours a week during the prior calendar year. This is what drives me crazy. So under PMLA, you look at the prior calendar year to see if they worked on average 25 hours or more. Um, whereas in FEMLA, you look back the prior 12-month period, not the calendar year. Also, if you look, PMLA, um, 25 hours times calendar month, number of weeks, that actually comes up to 1,300 hours in the prior calendar year, whereas under FEMLA, it's 1,250 hours in the prior 12-month period. So, I mean, they could have synchronized these a little better, these two laws, Poor HR people. Um, since we don't know how many hours each day Mr. Malinger works, we don't know if he'll satisf satisfy the number of hours requirement, but if he was hired with the expectation that he will work 25 hours a week on average, then for this issue he would qualify. Okay, thanks. What if Mr. Malinger is a vice president of Turbo? Does he qualify for family and medical leave? Yes, but remember under family medical leave, um, he would probably be treated as a key employee, which is, um, you know, the company has different rights. They have to grant the leave, but that doesn't mean that they have to take him back. They have to determine if keeping his job open and hiring him back at the end of the leave would cause them um, I forget the the uh, balance, but it's something like a significant hardship kind of a thing. So yes, he would qualify, but he may be a key employee and may not have reinstatement rights. Okay, thanks. Would he qualify as a vice president 
um, for Paid Medical Leave Act as an exempt employee? No, actually exempt employees are excluded under the PMLA. Um, an employer can include exempt employees in its policy if it wants to, but it's not required to do so. Okay, what if he is a bookkeeper for Turbo and his office where he works is in Toledo? Does that fact affect his eligibility for FMLA leave? Isn't this crazy how just one little fact will change things up? Um, well, it depends. If there are 50 plus employees within 75 miles of where Mr. Malinger works, then he'll qualify. But since we don't know where the rest of the Turbo employees are located, we don't know if he has FEMLA rights. If the rest of the employees are in Monroe, for example, then he would. If the rest of Turbo employees are in Lansing, then he wouldn't. Okay, and that what if he lives in Monroe but works in Toledo? Does that affect his eligibility for paid medical leave? No, only an employee whose primary work location is in Michigan qualifies. Uh, the place of residence just is not a factor unless the employee primarily works out of their home. Okay, so I think we've covered um, eligible employees. Now let's focus on the reason for time off. So for purposes to start, Let's assume that Mr. Malingerer needs time off for his own medical reasons. What if he needs time off for routine medical screening? Does this qualify for FMLA leave? Nope. Unless the examination is to determine if a serious health condition exists, it won't qualify. Okay, so same question. Um, would routine medical screenings and examinations be covered for or, um, under the Paid Medical Leave Act? Yes, unlike FEMLA, time off for such things as routine dental appointments, annual mammograms, a common cold, et cetera, are covered under the PMLA. Okay, so let's switch it up a one little thing again. Let's look at what, excuse, yeah, excuse me, who is having the medical problem? Let's assume Mr. Malingerer is otherwise qualified under both FMLA and PMLA. What okay. if he needs time off? Okay, so he's qualified employee, the covered employer, both acts. What if the time off he requests is to care for his youngest son, who's seven, and is having his gallbladder out? Will he qualify for FMLA leave? Uh, John, move the slide forward one. Okay, so here we are. We've got the seven-year-old taking time off for his gallbladder to come out. So assuming that Mr. Malinger is otherwise qualified for PMLA, um, or actually under the FMLA, um, he would be qualified for, for FEMLA because the surgery to remove the gallbladder will qualify as a serious health condition. And since it is a child under 18, who he will be providing care for, yeah, it would qualify. Okay, what if he wants the time off because his 32-year-old son needs his gallbladder out? Would he qualify for FMLA for that? Uh, Laura, maybe. Um, we, we know from the introduction that Mr. Malinger's kids, one of them, was left with some sort of a permanent medical issue following a car accident. Although an adult, if it was this child and he was incapable of self-care because of a mental or physical disability just prior to the time that the FEMLA leave was to commence, in other words, it wasn't because of the medical condition that's needing the leave, but this is an adult child who basically needs to have someone take care of him, then providing care for this child would be covered. However, generally, a child 18 years old or older is not someone that the employee can take time off to care for under FEMLA for the removal of the gallbladder. Of course, if the child was injured as a result of military service, again, um, that would be different analysis under FEMLA, and he may be able to take time off under FEMLA for that. Okay, so stick with the adult child, 32 years old, and this time he's just simply sick with a common cold. 
would Mr. Malingerer qualify for FMLA lease to care for him under that situation? No. The common code is not a serious health condition under FEMLA, and it wouldn't matter if the adult child was incapable of self-care because of a mental or physical disability at the time that FEMLA was to commence. Okay, what if it was the adult child, simply sick with a common cold, would he qualify for PMLA leave to care for that child? Yes, he would. Um, if it's for an, any illness or injury, preventive care, et cetera, and a child of the employee, regardless of age, it will qualify under the PMLA. Hey, Laura, I think I can actually hear the HR people groaning right now. Like, seriously, you can stay <laughs> home to take care of your 40-year-old kid who has a cold? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, sorry. that's where you want to get the doctor's note. <laughs> yeah. Make him jump through the hoop. Absolutely. Okay, so let's go back to the seven-year-old. What if the seven-year-old who needed his gallbladder out was actually Mr. Malingerer's grandchild? Would FMLA be triggered and give him time off in that scenario? Laura, only if the child was adopted by Mr. Merlinger or being fostered by him, or if the child was a legal ward, or if Mr. Malinger was standing in locus parentis to the child, basically raising him. That's the only way a grandchild would, would be covered under FMLA. Okay, same scenario. Would Mr. Malingerer be eligible for time off under PMLA to care for the seven-year-old grandchild getting his gallbladder out? He sure would, and he would not need to be in locus parentis or anything else because caring for a grandchild, a grandparent, or a sibling is covered under PMLA, unlike under FEMLA. Okay, let's move on to a different family member. Well, we assume, we don't really even know if she's a family member. What if the woman who lived with Mr. Malingerer needed bed rest as part of her prenatal care and if and Mr. Malingerer wanted time off under FMLA to care for her? Uh, this would not qualify for FEMLA unless they were legally married under state law where, um, where the marriage was entered. Incidentally, um, little known fact, if they lived together in Ohio and established a common law marriage there before it was abolished in 1991, then yes, if they had a common law marriage, they would qualify. But there's, there has to be a legal marriage for Mr. Malinger to care for a spouse under the FMLA. Okay. What if Mr. Malinger wanted the time off under PMLA to care for this woman who needs bed rest and any other care as part of her prenatal care? Could he take time off under PMLA? Well, that actually would depend on whether the woman is a family m member under PMLA. For example, <laughs> even a sister. Remember also that even without an illness, um, if the rumors were true and she was raped, Mr. Malinger could take time off to do such things as take her to counseling or to meeting with the prosecutor to help her relocate. Um, if, if, for example, she had a spouse that was um, physically abusive to her and she plans on fleeing in the middle of the day while he's at work next Tuesday and this is his sister, he could take the day off to help pack the moving truck, truck and help her relocate. But there still has to be a relationship that's recognized under the PMLA. Okay. Well, what if Mr. Malingerer wants time off under FMLA on an intermittent basis after the baby is born to take the child to doctor um, to his well appointments? Well, both laws uh, are going to require you to first look at the relationship between Mr. Malingerer and the child. For example, is it his child? Will he be in locus parentis um, under FMLA? wellness appointments don't qualify for a serious health condition. So Mr. Malinger could only take this time off to bond with the baby under FEMLA. And, and while he's bonding with the baby, he could take the baby to the doctors for wellness visits. But remember, this is one of the options employers have. They don't have to allow employees to take 
um, time off on an intermittent basis to bond with the baby after the baby's born. That's the employer can say you have to take like a, like your glob of time off and you know like three months in a row for that or however much time they can afford to take off but not like Tuesday morning and then next week on Wednesday afternoon or three days this week or whatever that's that's optional for the employer yeah thanks that's a good reminder I think um, we all forget about that at times what if Mr. Malingerer wants time off under the Paid Medical Leave Act to take the child to the doctor's office for wellness exams? Well, under PMLA, if the right relationship exists, for example, it's his grandchild or his own kid, um, if it turns out, <laughs> this would be weird, if it turns <laughs> out to be his sister, <laughs> so it's the aunt that's living with him or, or mother, whatever. Anyhow, then you could take time off for wellness appointments, routine examinations, and you could do this up to 40 hours in a year, uh, one hour at a time. Um, I have to say that there's, um, when I was discussing this with some other attorneys and we were talking about, you know, how much little bit of time the employee can use under Paid Medical Leave Act. And um, as you mentioned earlier, for example, if you have four hours um, in your PTO policy, written policy, that they could take it in four-hour chunks instead of one-hour chunks. Um, I, you know, the law develops very slowly, especially under Michigan law. Under federal law, the law gets passed. You get this outline of what the law means. And then the agency that it's assigned to, like the EEOC or the Department of Labor, will, will publish regulations. And that kind of fills in a lot of the blanks. And even then, there's still blanks. And so you wait for the lawsuits to start and the court decisions. It just kind of fill in the holes that are still there, the what ifs, like we're doing today. What if this happens? What if that happens? Well, under Michigan law, the law develops more slowly. You get a law that's an outline, and you don't really get the regulations afterwards to fill in the blanks. So you have to wait for the lawsuits to come. Now, when I look at how little um, bit of time an employer can require its employees to use, if you have Family Medical Leave Act and you're requiring them to use PTO in one hour increments, um, I see that this law could mean that, well, you've said for this purpose, you can use it in as little as one hour increments because that's as big as FEMLA allows you to, that you might be stuck with that. Now, other attorneys disagree, but you know, if I've had some clients who say you can take your PTO only at a week at a time, you get one week. And I don't know that the PMLA would be satisfied with you've got a cold and you have to stay home, but the policy is you have to take it one week at a time. That's how you've always done it. And now for this cold, they just burned up their full year's worth of accrual. So, you know, we, we have to wait to see how the law develops but I think that it could be that if you have FEMLA and you require them to use it not more than an hour at a time, then you might be stuck with that hour. But time will tell, and maybe one of our clients will be a test case and we can help develop the law. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, but I think you have to approach it from a practical standpoint. Uh, no one is going to buy that somebody has to use their PMLA in one chunk of time. It's clearly not what was intended by the law, but I'm, I think if you have other um, policies that allow different blocks of time, I don't know that you'll be bound by FMLA's one hour increment, but again, yeah. like you said, we'll have to wait for it to shake out. Yeah, we'll see. All right. So next slide. Okay, now we're going to focus on the length of leave. How much time can Mr. Malingerer take, which we kind of just touched on, but Mr. Malingerer asked for some time off for a medical reason. He didn't specify John, how much. John, just one second. John, change the slide, please. There we go. Okay. He didn't specify how much, except that he may need as much as four months off. We need to see if he can take as much as four months off under any law. So 
First question, if Mr. Malingerer takes the last 12 weeks of the year off for his own medical condi condition, how much time off could he take under FMLA? Well, it depends on what year, what 12 month period the employer is using. Under FEMLA, um, this could be a rolling year for tracking the leave, which most employers use, in which case he only gets the 12 weeks in a rolling 12 year. But if they use a calendar year, and a few of my, not too many, but a few of my clients use a calendar year, if that happens, then he can take 12 weeks, October, November, December, and then he can take 12 weeks, January, February, March for a six month, uh, not really a vacation, but six months <laughs> off. You never know. <laughs> um, if Mr. Malingerer takes the last 12 weeks of the year off for his own medical condition, how much time off could he take under PMLA? Well, next slide, John. Um, I guess it wasn't. Well, under PMLA, he can take 40 hours of time off with each with pay each benefit year for his own medical issues. Um, Turbo, like most employers for PMLA, is using a calendar year because this um, this is how they track paid time off traditionally. Um, and since that is the case, the first week of FMLA in October would have been paid time off under PMLA. Um, and then, uh, assuming he still had the 12, you know, the, the one week of paid medical leave available to him in October. And Mr. Malinger will have 40 more hours of PMLA available come January, since Turbo is using the calendar year and it gives out a uh, lump sum um, every January 1. So, um, however, if Turbo had provided PMLA on a accrual basis, then Mr. Malinger would have exhausted his PMLA time in October at the beginning of his FEMLA leave, and he would not have had any hours to roll over into the new calendar year. And he, since he's not working, he would not have accrued any more time under the PMLA since he's not been working. So you can see how it differs between whether you use the accrual method or whether or not you use the lump sum method. And it looks like it could be a tracking nightmare for HR. Um, so what happens when 12 weeks of FMLA ends and there's no more paid medical leave available? Can Mr. Malingerer still take more leave for his own medical issue or does he have to come back to work or be terminated? Well, he's probably going to still be able to take more time off because remember under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, a leave of absence can be a reasonable accommodation. Um, so the way it kind of plays out is when the Family Medical Leave Act ends, but not before, it's the day after, the Turbo would then send out a request for further information to determine if additional time off is a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. Um, Turbo must wait until the day after FEMLA ends since the law limits what employers can request as far as information while the employee is under FEMLA leave. So Turbo should, in my opinion, always seek legal assistance when drafting the request for information under the ADA since it's too easy to violate that law and since the EEOC has made it clear that if you just use the same form requesting the same information over and over, you're going to violate the law. You've got to only ask the questions that make sense under the circumstances. All right, that's a good tip. So how long can Mr. Malingerer stay on leave if he qualifies under the ADA? Well, he is a malingerer, assuming Mr. Malinger has a disability <laughs> under the ADA, and most medical conditions seem to qualify now, um, and assuming granting leave does not cause turbo and undue hardship, he could have his leave extended as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA until turbo gets to the point that it can show that it would cause it an undue hardship. 
And that's actually a very high standard to prove, and it's the employer's proof to show that it has an undue hardship. So think of it this way, you know, an employer with only, um, you know, 20 employees, it, it may be harder for them to cover a missing employee than someone who has 100 employees. And they all, it also looks at your financial resources that are available and so on. But the one thing that we can count on is that repeated requests for extensions, repeated, not just one one request, or an actual request for leave without an end date are an indefinite leave request. And even the EEOC says that an indefinite leave request is an undue hardship. So if the leave is extended under the ADA, it's A, does Turbo have to pay its cost of Mr. Malingerer's health insurance as, you know, they have to do that under FMLA. Do they have to do that under ADA for an extended leave? Um, probably not. Um, it depends on how your health insurance and your other insurance benefit plans are written. Um, so it, HR people should be looking at their summary plan descriptions, the actual plan documents and see. Typically, most employers' plan documents say that only employees who are regularly working 30 plus hours a week or more qualify for these benefits. And so if an employee was, for example, um, put on partial layoff where they're only working 20 hours a week, they would no longer qualify. Well, the same thing happens when an employee's off on a um, medical leave. They're actually no longer working the 30 plus hours and because they no longer fit the definition of eligibility under your health insurance plans, you're, you're supposed to send them a COBRA notice and their insurance would actually end. Again, it depends on how your plan is written. Some plans say that it ends the day that you drop to zero and you're terminated. Others say it ends at the end of the month when that happens. So you have to check your plan. But the only reason employees get to stay on your health insurance during family medical leave is because FMLA says you have to keep them on there if they want to. Um, but the day after they are no longer on FEMLA and just off on a leave of absence because you have a policy that allows them to or as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, then you should be sending out your COBRA notices. So I think that that is a policy that a lot of employers don't consider. And when you're doing a handbook, People need to think about how they want to handle it when people are off on ADA and are, are they going to send that COBRA letter? Are you going to advise people that you'll pay their health coverage? Are you allowed to do that um, under your health plan? Um, questions that people should be considering. That's, that's an issue that arises and no one ever seems to have, have anticipated it in advance. So finally, what happens if Mr. Malingerer needs additional time off, not because of his own medical problem, but to care for a family member? Well, generally speaking, that can be denied unless Turbo's employment policies, practices, or a collective bargaining agreement um, provide for granting time off under these conditions. But additional time off under the FMLA, the PMLA, or the ADA is not required. And we can end on that happy note. All right, so FMLA, ADA, and PMLA can seem like a maze of overlapping requirements, in part because they are, because just one fact matters in these situations. It is important to get all the facts from your supervisors and your involved employees. And then you have to take those facts and analyze them under each law. Don't Stop if one applies because two or three may apply to the situation and seek assistance from your employment attorney when it's appropriate these are complicated situations and they're just minefields um, fraught with um, potential lawsuits for employers so uh, gather your facts and do your analysis and if you aren't certain that you're on the right track seek help yeah, these are very difficult laws. So John, do we have any questions? 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, apologies for getting the slides mixed up a little bit. I'm just a poor marketing guy. I got no shot of keeping this stuff straight. So um, there, 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 there are a couple here. Um, there's one is, is, um, is there specific paperwork to request PMLA leave like there is for FEMLA? No, you can come up with whatever form you want. But remember, if it turns out that it's also FMLA time, now you're restricted. So don't think, well, because it's also PMLA, we can ask whatever we want, because in this case, FMLA would restrict you. Uh, just as a reminder, if you want to ask a question, go ahead and use the questions uh, area of our GoToWebinar platform and just type that in real quick, and we'll try to answer those. Um, some folks are asking about recordings and things. I'll get to that in just in a minute. There is one other question right now uh, while we wait and see if there are any others. If an employer requests documentation when, when an employee requests his sick leave, does a letter from a babysitter unable to watch an employee's child sufficient documentation under Michigan's sick leave law? Interesting. Yeah, well, I wouldn't accept it. What about you? Well, it would depend on, I'm a little confused by the facts. Is the child sick and the babysitter saying they can't watch the child because the child's sick? Or is the babysitter sick? Or so is the, the child sick, sick? Or is the child sick and they want the babysitter to write the note to the doctor saying, I had to come babysit the kid because the kid was sick and couldn't go to school? I wouldn't yeah, buy I don't that. Think I don't think a babysitter is sufficient certification in in any of those, really. Yeah, no. First of all, the kid's got to be the one that's sick. And right. I'm not going to accept the note from the babysitter that had to come over and watch the kid because they couldn't come to school. They should be taking the sick kid to the doctor for that note. Right. I agree. Okay. Here's one that's, uh, is there any requirement that the people an employee is assisting for PMLA live with the employee, if not any limitations? No, they just have to be a family member. Um, they don't yeah, have don't to live with, live with them. Okay. So there's, there's, another... there's a list at the beginning of the slides that lists the family members. You know, it's uh, all different forms of children, all different forms of parents, um, a, a, someone that you're living with who you're legally married to, a spouse, grandparent, grandchild, or, you know, all different forms of siblings. And honestly, FMLA doesn't require a live-in relationship either. Right. It could be the father with a minor child, but the mother has custody. So the father has to watch the sick kid or take them to, for surgery or whatever. Okay, here's another question. Can leave be assigned as PMLA or must the employee request PMLA specifically? I think when they, at the beginning of the year, when they've got their time in their bank, any time that they take time off, um, it ticks away at their PTO bank. Um, and if you want to limit how much time off you can take, for example, like on a moment's notice kind of a thing, on, like you can for PMLA, you can ask for the reason. And if it qualifies, you count it against the bank. It yeah, counts, I, you know, I, I don't think the Paid Medical Leave Act actually addresses that, but as an employer, I think your policy should and you should require, a lot of my clients put an extra checkbox on their leave request and ask if it's um, for, a re, you know, for a reason covered by PMLA, and if it is, they're clicking off those hours from their time bank. Yeah, some, some of my clients actually have um, policies with their PTO where if you want a week off in advance, you you know, you got to ask for it in advance for a week off. Um, but to just call in that day and say, I can't make it in, um, that now it's limited to PMLA, like those emergency things. Or there, some of them are more liberal than, say, for the hot water tank or something like that. But it's got to be a true emergency. 
Um, but the point is, is you can't say if it turns out to be PMLA, you can't say, I'm sorry, but you can't have the day off. We need you in here today. So you should probably find out before you deny it whether or not it qualifies for PMLA. And they still have the 40 hours available for the year. If they have 120 hours in their bank, you, know, you don't have to wait for the 120 hours to be exhausted. And they only get 40 for that last minute kind of PMLA issue. Great. The only other uh, comment we have is uh, there's somebody that was hoping that you could touch base again on the child bonding issue. Um, maybe just kind of quickly revisit that issue under the two leave requests or acts. Sure. Well, under FMLA, um, once the baby is born, either parent can take time off to bond with their baby. But there are certain things under the FMLA that the employer actually gets to choose what they want in their policy. So, for example, you can make employees burn through their paid time off during FEMLA, or you don't have to make them burn through their time off. Um, when short-term disability kicks in, you can allow them to supplement that 66 and 0.6 hours that they're paid for. Um, or 66%, you can allow them to supplement with PTO to bring them up to 100% pay. So there's some choices that employers have. You can allow them to work while they're on FMLA for another employer, or you can forbid them from working while they're off on FEMLA with you. This is one of those options. So once the baby's born, the employer has the ability to say, you can or cannot take your FEMLA time now, now that the baby's born and is healthy, you can or cannot take the time off on an intermittent or reduced leave basis. You can just say to the in your policy that you have 12 weeks of leave after the baby's born. You can continue that 12 weeks of leave, but you're not going to take it like on an intermittent and reduced leave. And, and that would include wellness visits because wellness visits are um, not a serious health condition under the Family Medical Leave Act. It's just, it's, it's basically you're just spending more time with the baby and, you know, take him to the doctor's cute little thing. And so, you, you know, it, it doesn't really count as a serious health condition. Now, if the baby's sick, now you've got a different issue. It's not to bond with the baby. Now it's because they actually have a serious health condition and that you have to allow them to use on an intermittent basis if it's, if it's medically necessary. Great, thank you for that. Okay, I don't see any further questions in our queue, so we're gonna go ahead and move on um, just to wrap things up a little bit today. Um, uh, at the conclusion of your, our program, we're going to send to you a survey. We hope you'll take just a few minutes to complete that. Um, as I always mention after these webinars, we really do take that feedback seriously and, and consider any topics that you suggest uh, for our future webinars. So please uh, complete that survey and we will review it. Uh, the other thing is that we're, we, um, uh, we are uh, going to be providing uh, the presentation slide or excuse me, the presentation slides and our uh, recording on our website. Uh, it is gonna be recorded, hopefully posted later today, if not tomorrow morning. So please take a look at our website for that uh, video recording or the uh, PowerPoint in PDF form. The other thing I'd like to mention before we sign off for the day is that we have our sophisticated employer blog. If you're not familiar with it, head over to plunkacooney.com. And in our blog section, you'll find the Sophisticated Employer blog. We have a lot of great information there. Um, many of our attorneys uh, post to the blog, including uh, Claudia, who does a great job of covering a lot of break, uh, breaking news type events. So check that out. You can also subscribe by entering your email address. And on behalf of the group, uh, Claudia and Laura, myself, John Cornwell, thanks so much for being part of our program today. And we hope you can join us in the future. Have a great rest of the day.